The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. U.S. vet Jeremiah Pospisil was raised in San Diego, California, and suffered from depression, three failed marriages, and three suicide attempts. But in 2018, a near-death experience completely changed his life. Jeremiah found his purpose during that NDE, the result of a motorcycle accident. He had a life review while traveling through a tunnel with his life passing before his eyes, and he has only recently begun to share it. He has said he knows if he doesn't share it, it will be wasted. Now, before I introduce our guest, I want to say a few words about his namesake, the prophet Jeremiah from the Old Testament. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he kept warning Israel that the Babylonians were coming to conquer Jerusalem. People got so tired of hearing it, they attempted to kill him. One time they put him in the stockades. Another time they threw him into a cistern where he sank in the mud and would have died but was rescued by an Ethiopian. Anyway, whenever I've based a sermon on readings from Jeremiah, I always get asked, why was Jeremiah a bullfrog? Referring, of course, to Joy to the World, the 1970s song made popular by Three Dog Night. Wikipedia says a common interpretation is that writer Hoyt Axton's bullfrog is the prophet Jeremiah, and that the song represents God's desire to unite all people in happiness. For example, one of the most often quoted verses in the Bible comes from Jeremiah 29, 11. It goes, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Jeremiah Pospisil, welcome to NDE Radio. Wow, Lee. Okay. That has got me cheering up right now. Speaking of the weeping prophets. (laughs) (laughs) Powerful, and, and that's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, to be honest with you, is because that allows any doubt that seeps into my my spirit, in essence, to leave me, because I'm not in control of this, you know, and I'll tell you what, like, I really resonate with that verse, and I'm, I'm thankful <laughs> that you brought it up, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You know, I've been bringing up the historic prophet Jeremiah, not just because your name's the same, but because um, I see some real parallels in your, in your lives, both in the suffering and in your potential for accomplishing real good in the world, given enough time. Uh, The prophet said he couldn't keep God's words inside him, that when he tried to keep quiet, the words burned in his mouth and he had to speak. You had a pretty tough life before the revelations of your life-changing NDE. Tell us about your growing up. Did Did you grow up in a religion and what was your life like as a kid? Sure. So I, um, I grew up in Southern California. Um, you know, my parents were Baptists. We went to a Baptist church right across the street from my, my house. And, you know, it was really a, a great experience growing up because we would spend time together on Sundays, you know, and Wednesdays we would go to, um, you know, they had this thing called the WANA and you would go there and spend time to kind of, uh, share your your life with other kids your age you know in the christian environment um which was which was great for me you know and um so i really loved growing up in san diego but it was it was really not the ideal san diego that everybody sees in the movies or or hears about you know it it actually was in a harder environment than than most know about and for me it was a tough place to grow up you know i remember when I was in elementary school, I was walking to school with my new skateboard that my parents had got me a Tony Hawk Mini. Mm. And, um, I was uh, assaulted and the ball was stolen from me. And this is probably when I'm about 10 years old. You know, so it, it's my life started off really hard, you know, and it progressively got harder to deal with. You know, I grew up in junior high. Um, you know, I would get jumped or I would get in trouble or I'd get hit over the head with crowbars and stuff. And um, in high school, I would deal with more violence um, that really got to the point where my my one of my best friends, Poncho, was stabbed to death 72 times. 
Um, so it was a very hard environment to grow up in. You know, and it was really weird because I remember the incident with my skateboard where I was a sweet little innocent kid. And in that one moment, I remember being in the principal's office with blood coming down my face, thinking, I need to be something different. I need to protect myself. I need to become somebody who protects this spirit or this body, you know, and I remember this, this change that happened in that one moment. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't just everything was great in San Diego. And I grew up in this great environment where we went to church and family was great. You know, my parents worked a lot. You know, I was the oldest of four children. So I helped my dad with his businesses and, and helping around the house and watched my younger siblings. There was a, a lot that I had to endure and had to kind of overcome, you know. I think Lilia mentioned that it was at 15 you tried to kill yourself. Yeah, 15 or 16, I had my first suicide attempt, you know, and I had always been an emotional being, you know, I've always felt emotions so deeply. Um, I've been empathetic my whole life, you know, and that was really, it was like I was being in this environment and I was feeling all these emotions and they were so overwhelming to me, you know, so after my, uh, one of my best friends, um, Ended up passing away, got stabbed to death 72 times. Um, it was really hard for me. It was hard for me to deal with death. It was hard for me to deal with, you know, the hatred of the world and how negative the world is. And then all of the outside influences coming into me and I'm feeling these emotions. I had no place to put them. I didn't know where to, to, to put them and how to process them. Um, so it became like this, this energy or power within me that I didn't know what to do with. And it just like hit a wall, you know, I would become frustrated and, and, and depressed and have anxiety. And to this one point where I was, I couldn't deal with it anymore. And um, I ended up taking a gun and I had planned on shooting myself, which I haven't really told this story a lot. So I'm glad to do so now, but um, you know, I sat in my bathroom in my old house in San Diego and I was planning to shoot myself and I was holding the gun and I remember the gun falling out of my hand for whatever reason. I, I don't rem really remember why I didn't know if I loosened my grip or whatever, but the gun fell out of my hands. And as it hit the floor, the gun went off and shot a hole through the ceiling. And that startled me so much that I really started reflecting upon my life and reflecting upon what I was doing. And it almost woke me up like, like I was in a haze or like I was in a state of so much depression that I couldn't think about what reality was. And this gunshot, the sound of it woke me up and it said, almost like, don't do this. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. you know? So it was, it was really crazy, you know? And, and during the years, I, I really had to learn to kind of curtail the information or the emotions that would come into me. I mean, I'm a very empathetic person. I'm a very intuitive person, but back then my, my mind was not able to, to process how to deal with it. There might have been some spiritual intervention there. The yeah. notion of guardian angels isn't altogether wrong. <laughs> I agree. So were you, as a teenager, did you get involved in drugs? Uh, as I couldn't get involved in drugs because the world seemed like a drug to me as it was. It was so powerfully stimulating to me. I didn't get involved in drugs. And I was involved in I was involved in a gang. I guess you could say it wasn't really a gang, but it was a gang. And it was a group of people that I felt that I had to protect myself with, you know, because I was feeling this experience of violence and whatnot. Um, you know, but drugs were never an option at that point for me. You know, it happened later on in life that I, that I tried and experimented with drugs. Um, but for me, this life was so complicated and so complex enough that I didn't want to even alter the reality that I was living in because it was too much for me already, you know? And uh, how old were you when you got into the military? Uh, I started at 17 and a half, um, right out of high school. I got in and got into the National Guard, the Army National Guard. And, um, you know, I wanted to kind of serve a purpose and kind of, figure out who I was and get out of the environment that I was growing up in, you know, and, and I think that was a really fun experience for me, for sure. Uh, um, 
Lily has said that someone shot at you at one point. Was that in the military or was it? Before? No, no, that was, that was before the military. Yeah. So my dad owned a construction company. And so I've had these really weird experiences in my life where I should have been injured significantly, or I should have been shot or, or, or killed or, or whatever. And this particular instance was um, my dad owned a construction company. And I was cleaning up some graffiti. And as I was cleaning up this graffiti, I had, there was a, a person that walked by. It looked like a, a gangbanger. Of, you know, I, I don't know what else I could use there with that um, word. But it was a, a, a gang member who was walking by. And I remember speaking to him and saying, you know, tell your gang members, tell your friends not to, to tag up this area that I was cleaning up. I was cleaning up graffiti on a wall or a fence. And um, he uh, ended up turning back to me and pulled out a gun from his sock and fired at me and fired nine rounds at me. Wow. And, yeah, it was 25, 30 feet away and unloaded an entire clip at me. And every bullet that he fired missed. It didn't hit his mark. It went past my head. And I remember the feeling of the, the bullets whizzing past my ears and whizzing past my head and feeling almost the concussion of the air changing within my body, you know? Huh. And, uh, it was really an intense situation, you know? And uh, like, I, I, I don't know, I, like even in that one moment, it's almost like something intervened to save me. Something stopped that from happening for sure. Sounds like, wow. Then I understand you fell asleep at the wheel when you were around 23 or so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I was working a job where I was working 80 to 90 hours a week, even a hundred hours. Point. And at this point I was, uh, driving up to LA from San Diego, which is about a three and a half hour drive, you know, and I had to be there at four o'clock in the morning. And, uh, I had done this numerous times this week and, uh, I was going to work one morning. I was extremely tired and my brother was supposed to go with me that morning. And at the last minute, the night before he called me and said, Hey, I'm not going to be going with you to help you out. I said, no problem. I'm gonna go do it myself. And, uh, ended up going to work the next morning super tired which i probably shouldn't have been driving and uh went to work and i was doing about 60 miles an hour 65 on a road and i fell asleep and it, i remember it was around a curve and around that curve it was in a, in a residential community um and there were houses all around me and there was a concrete light pole and what had happened was i fell asleep and I hit the concrete light pole, which deviated my path from running into a house, which I easily could have run into the house and ended up rolling my car eight times, um, hit my head significantly wow. and, you know, slid about three to 400 yards down the road. And uh, I blacked out in that experience. And it really was a, uh, it really was a traumatic event because I, I remember being in this space that was completely void and i wasn't aware or conscious of the accident you know and that was really significant to me because i had almost gone somewhere you know like outside of my body but i hadn't really experienced near death experience before so this was kind of a new thing for me and uh you know i remember being upside down in the truck and bleeding after having hit that and rolling eight times, not remembering anything that had happened because I'd been in this void and thinking, what had just happened to me? What happened? Mm. You know, I wasn't really sure. And uh, I cut myself out of the seatbelt, got outside the truck, walked up to the curb, sat down on the curb and thought to myself, wow, I should be dead. I really should be dead right now. You know, and at, at that time, I didn't really understand what had happened you know and the fire department came and they looked at the truck and they thought where's the they actually asked me they said hey who's the owner of this vehicle like wh where's he at he should be dead and I'm like that's me i mean that's i'm sitting right here you know <laughs> what like you walked out of that with i had hand injuries i had glass in my face i had glass in my cheek right here that you know it, it was embedded in there 
And um, I literally should have died in that, that experience. That's, that's the second one for me. Now, I think Lilia said that when you were in that black void, that colors came to you or yeah. a different understanding of colors. Yeah. So um, colors came to me, you know, I had um, what had happened was as I went into that black space, there were, there was a, it was, it was void of any color at first, you know, I I had hit my head inside the truck and I was rolling over and um, the blackness, I was kind of like disengaged from my body. Um. I don't know how it's hard to explain because it's so weird, right? Like the, the whole experience. But as I was in this void, I started to notice colors coming from each side of me, coming into my my perception, right? And the colors started out as gold, and they quickly kind of shifted and changed into. Uh, blues and purples you know they went from gold and yellow and oranges to um, blues and purples and as soon as they started forming um, they they, they kind of shot in from the outside you know like I'm going I'm in this void and they started coming from the outside and they started out the gold it's almost like you're you're um, what do you call that perception when you you're not looking at it but it's outside of your field of view Right, but you can still see it, right? So I call it a near death experience, <laughs> yeah, right? So um, it started coming in to my field of view or my acknowledgement, yeah, and it started shifting from orange, gold, blue, purple, and purple was almost right in front of me. Um, and that experience didn't really last long. Um, as soon as it hit the purple, I acknowledged it. I was aware of it. And uh, then it just kind of went back to where it started from. Mm. I remember waking up or being more alert into where I was in in position. And I was upside down in my vehicle at that time, you know, and it was just a really weird experience. I, like, I had been knocked out before. I used to wrestle, play football, play soccer, you know, so I, I had been, you know, hit over the head, you know, inadvertently. But this time it was it was different. It was really different. Lilia suggested that there might have been some uh, intelligence communicated with this with these colors. That something might have ended your perception that you hadn't been aware of before. So okay, colors. We look at colors now, right? And we're like, okay, that's a purple. That's a red, right? Yeah. For me, these colors had feeling they had emotion attached to them right Mm. and they were they were extremely powerful to me because colors in themselves are beautiful to look at right but when colors are attached to an emotion or a feeling right it changes the entire dynamics of what that color means and um and this happened later on in my experience with uh, my motorcycle wreck my last experience with my nde um but colors are more than just the color, right? You can feel colors. You know, colors have a, a reverberating frequency in order to establish that color, right? And for me, I, it was almost as though I started to feel the experience of the frequency of the individual colors. You know, and now as they were coming into my perception, I could start to feel different changes lower level frequencies were like the oranges and golds and as it progressed to blues and went through the whole spectrum i got to this purple and i was like wow this is a great color right and i could almost i could feel the color i could see the color i could sense the color you know and it was really weird but that that time it didn't last very long that time it it just i got a brief introduction to it you know almost like a precursor And uh, it it, it vanished out of my perception, you know, and then I was back into my vehicle, my truck. You had another NDE before the motorcycle NDE? Yeah. Tell us about that. I was in the military and got injured in the military um, on a train accident and compressed my spine and had a a ruptured disc and a herniated disc. 
And um, I have had six spine surgeries since then. Wow. And um, one of the spine surgeries that they did was they did a fusion on my front of my spine and then also on the rear of my spine. And the second surgery, I had an anterior fusion through my L5S1. And they put a plate and two screws or four screws into my spine. And then I had a secondary surgery where they put a plate. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. Four screws and two rods into the back of my spine to kind of stabilize it, right? Um, and during that second surgery, I, the doctor misplaced the pedicle screw, drilled it into my sciatic nerve, and ended up paralyzing me on, from my waist down on my left side. Right. So my left leg was completely useless. I couldn't move it. I couldn't do anything with it. Wow. And um, so they came back and said, listen, here's the deal. We're going to have to have another surgery for you. We're going to have to correct the damage that was done. We're going to have to pull out the screws, pull out the rods on one side, and then, uh, you know, hopefully get you through rehab. So they did another surgery on me. And during that surgery, when I came out of it, I ended up having a, a high fever, I had a 106 degree fever. And two days later, they ended up uh, transferring me to a rehab hospital, went to the rehab hospital and worked on trying to learn how to walk again. Cause like my pain and my leg weren't really working. You know, it wasn't really working at all. And I uh, had to go through rehab. And during the rehab process, I realized that what that fever was, was that was an infection, you know, and I was at the rehab hospital for about a month and a half, maybe just slightly over a month. And the infection started to grow and build to the point where I had a bulge outside of my, uh, my uh, surgery site that was the size of a softball. And um, I got released from the rehab hospital. I went immediately to my neurosurgeon to his office and said, hey, listen, I'm not doing well. There's an infection in my body. Um, I need your help. And he said, come back. Let's get you some antibiotics next week. This was like on a Friday. He said, come back next week. Let's get you some antibiotics and let's get you healed up. So I went home and went to bed. The next night, this is one day out of being in rehab surgery or rehab hospital, I'm sorry. And I woke up and I, I didn't know what was going on around me. I couldn't comprehend it. I didn't understand what was going on. And uh, I called my uncle who was a doctor and I said, listen, I'm having some issues right now. I had the surgery. I had an infection. I had a fever. Um, can you help me understand what's going on right now? He says, you need to get to the hospital. You need to go to the hospital right now. He said, you have a really bad infection. Infection is going through your, your system, your bodily system, and your organs. And really what you need to do is get to the hospital. Call the ambulance, get them there so they can get you seen, and you can get this taken care of. And shortly after that, I ended up blacking out. And um, I went back into this void that I went to with my uh, car accident. You know what I mean? And called the ambulance, woke back out, out of the void. Ambulance showed up, took me to the ER and um, got to see the doctors there. And they're like, wow, you really shouldn't be here right now. You know, you were probably about five minutes away from dying again. You know, you, you should have been dead. You know, you have all this infection in your body and had to have a surgery to clean out my infection. I had to have a pick line into my arm that I had to give myself three antibiotic injections every day to where I, I didn't have to deal with this infection anymore. And I did that for about four and a half months, four months. Where when, you, when you went into that void, did you see the same colors you'd seen in the truck? This time I didn't see the colors as vividly. I didn't actually see colors at all. It was really just the void. Okay. Right. Um, so there was something to the void, though, that made me kind of remember that, hey, you were here already, right? You were, you were already here in this moment. 
and I didn't get to the same um, death or the same um, destination, I guess you could say, but I was definitely in the same space, right? I was definitely in the same space, and uh, it was just a, it's a weird, it's a weird place. It's a weird, peaceful place. It's a place of nothing bothers you. You're 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 outside of your body, right? You don't feel the the resistance of the energy flow that you feel like within normal existence. Your 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 spirit, your energy is outside of itself. It's outside of the confines of your body. So it wasn't, I didn't have the colors, but I definitely had the experience of being in that void again, yeah. Well, I think I'm going to have you leap to the motorcycle NDE yeah. now, which is yeah. the one that's really changed your life. Yeah. Yeah, the motorcycle accident was, whoo, that was something. That was really something, Lee. I went out riding with my friend. It was his birthday one day. Oh, the, first of all, this wasn't that long ago, was it? No, this was three and a half, four years ago. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this is long after your first NDE. Yeah, yeah. My first NDE was about 15, 16, you know, and it's weird because it seems like it's gone in 10 year increments. Yeah. Where I go down this experience and then maybe that 10 years is meant for me to learn from it, right? I don't Proce think I. Learned, I processing is important. Yeah, processing is important, but. Yeah. I was so stubborn and hard-headedly that I didn't really process it. I was like, okay, that was an experience. Let me not, you know, worry about that again. Yeah. And, uh, but this motorcycle wreck that I had, I had to deal with depression and anxiety my whole life again, right? And um, this was my last marriage had come to a conclusion and um, went out going for a motorcycle ride with one of my friends and ended up crashing my motorcycle and i broke eight ribs i had internal bleeding a uh, punctured lung broken wrist and uh i remember riding and crashing and hitting my head so hard that i i came to the conclusion that this is how i die I remember thinking that to myself, this is how I die. And as I had that thought, I was thrust back into the blackness or the void or the space of what I had experienced with my injury with my spine. Same thing with my car accident, right? And I was back in that same place. But this time, I feel like I went further. And as I sat in that black space, kind of contemplating what had just happened, right? Something started happening. The, the colors started coming back to me. And they'd come from the outside. And they, again, went from the same stage. They went from orange, yellow, you know, into these beautiful blues and into this purple that I've never seen or experienced before. This purple was so dynamic that I could feel the colors again, you know, and they formed up into a, uh, a tunnel, I guess you could say. It was a tunnel. And in this tunnel, there were these little pixels. And these pixels each contained a, a, a moment into my life. They were... They were full of colors and they were full of experiences and feelings and emotions. And I remember being in this tunnel, being able to look around at all these different like pixels. They were small pixels in this entirety of this tunnel. And I would look at these pixels, these small little pixels. And what they would do is I would almost be like thrust into them or I could feel being in that pixel and that pixel contained an entirety of an experience in my life whether it was dealing with somebody um, talking to somebody a job uh, uh, running into somebody at the gas station each one was its own individual um, experience 
And I remember looking at this experience and looking at these pixels and thinking, wow, there's a whole lot of them, right? There's a whole lot of them. And, and they're all connected in some form or fashion. And I remember looking at these pixels and thinking, wow, as I looked at them or as I was aware of them, I would be thrust into them. And when I was thrust into them, it was like I could feel every emotion that was in that one moment. And not only feel the one emotion, but I could feel the purpose behind what it was and why it was. And when I started to look at this one and then that one and the one over here, I would see that they were all connected. And that every emotion, every connection, everything was bound in some form or fashion and created my reality and created who I was, you know, and everything for me up until that point in reality was happenstance. It was like, well, this is just a circumstance. This person came into my life and then I ran into this guy at 7-Eleven. It was just like, whatever, it just happened. But it wasn't. When I looked at my life review, I could see how everything was connected. I could see how nothing was really truly happening to me, but it was happening for me. And how much was I going to buy into it or how much was I going to look into that fact that it was happening to me, not, you know, or, or for me, not to me, you know? And when I started to realize that, I could see this web of connection between everything that my life had given me. You know, and, and for, for a long period of my life, I looked at the resistance of my life and the troubles and the hardships and the depression and the anxiety. And it never made sense because I was literally living within this body and this body was in control of who I was. And my spirit was just backstage like, what are you doing? But I didn't know. My body was like, let's just do this. Let's experience this. Let's deal with this. Let's be in frustration with this because we don't know how to deal with it. And my spirit was back there saying, hello, here I am. You know, and during this life review, I realized that everything was connected. There was no longer any circumstance in my life. It was now they are placed within your life for a purpose. And I saw the purpose in each interaction. I saw the purpose in each communication with people, even though I didn't know them. Right, my energy or my light or my joy or my love and zest for life affected them somehow, or their love for life, or their joy, or their happiness, or even their sadness affected me in a certain way. And that interaction was meant to serve a purpose for my life, for an understanding of who I am, and for an understanding of what I'm meant to do. And as I went down this tunnel, I would see all these individual things and I would take great joy in each one of them because each one of them I found was a purpose for my life. Even, the, I, bad, even the bad experiences? Even the bad experiences. Yeah. Okay. So the bad experiences I realized in that, in that tunnel, right. That the bad experiences happened in that small pixel, right. And that small pixel by itself was maybe a bad time. But when I looked at all the pixels, I realized that that bad experience could continue on somehow. And, and for me, it was the information that I learned from that experience. Right. So the experience. Were you, I was going to say, were you accompanied at all? Was there anyone with you? <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So oh, when, I, was. When, I, when I first, yeah, it's really weird. So when I first started down the tunnel, like I, I was looking around, and I was kind of in amazement of what was going on. And I started going down and I started like almost reviewing each tile individually, but I didn't go through all the tiles because I kind of got the glimpse of what was going on. I felt the feeling of it all. And I remember feeling this presence behind me, right? And there was this entity behind me that was almost pushing me down the tunnel, but wasn't. It was almost like I was going down my own accord. Um, but the presence was there with me, right? And I, I, to this day, I don't know what it was. I don't know who it was. Um, but it, it was there with me, almost to make me feel like you're not alone. You know, everything that you're doing, everything that you're looking at through your life, 
you're not alone. There's, I'm here with you, right? And someone, maybe a, a guardian angel, maybe God. I don't, I don't know. But it was a, it was a peaceful presence, right? So I'm looking at these different portions of my life. I'm looking at these different colors that no longer are just colors to me. They have feeling and emotion to them. And when I looked at these life review sections or pixels, um, they, they weren't just the information. They were everything about the emotions with it, too. And the colors were vibrant. There were, there were colors that I'd never seen before in these experiences. And I had this presence behind me, almost guiding me through or being with me as I went through this tunnel. And I remember getting to the end of the tunnel. And I knew it was the end because the pixels were no longer colorful. They were blank. They were black. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what's going on here? Why are these here? And I remember the entity behind me, he told me a few words, and these words have impacted my life. And these are the words that I've, the reasoning that I've changed my whole life. And he said, become the purpose. Become the purpose. And I didn't understand that in the moment. I didn't know what that meant. I searched my entire life for my purpose. You know, and I struggled with finding my purpose and who I was. And um, he told me, become the purpose. Or it told me, become the purpose. And that was very powerful to me. And almost immediately, as soon as he had concluded speaking that to me, there was a beam of energy that came out of the void ahead of me. I was going through this tunnel. And at the end of the tunnel, there was nothing. It was nothing. It was just darkness. And then all of a sudden, this energy of this light came from the end of the tunnel and just shot into me, into whatever being or whatever, um, yeah, whatever being I was at that point, like energy being really is what I, what I feel myself as being. But I was just pure energy and pure acknowledgement. And this light shot into me. And when it shot into me, it was an overwhelming sense of information that I couldn't quantify. I couldn't disseminate. I couldn't understand. But I felt every bit of it. I felt every understanding that came with it, right? And it changed my life. It literally changed my life. And I remember feeling that feeling. And eventually waking up, this happened within a split second, right? But it felt like time didn't matter in this moment. Time didn't matter at all. I was in this crazy space where everything made sense and all of eternity was right here. And I could see it all. And then the information came to me. And as soon as the information came to me, after the entity spoke, become the purpose that I woke up out of my, into my body. And what was crazy is that I specifically and distinctly remember feeling the energy flow or the energy pattern, right, of my being and my understanding back into my body because there was this convoluted perception of how my energy was flowing. It didn't make sense. It was hard to understand. And I felt the resistance of my body containing my energy as opposed to being in this experience where everything was free, everything was flowing, everything was beautiful and lightweight. I felt weightless almost, you know, and coming into my body, I remember thinking, wow, what happened? Become the purpose. I get that. But how do I become the purpose? You know, and I had been on pain medication for about nine, ten years at that moment because I had a back injury in the military from that surgery, you know, the surgery I had earlier. And it was like the information started to disseminate within my body, within my mind, that I no longer had to take prescription pain medication that I had been on for pain for like nine or ten years. And I thought, wow. 
okay, so as soon as I heal up from these eight broken ribs and the broken wrist and the punctured lung and the internal bleeding, as soon as that happens, I'm done with prescription medication. I'm done taking my painkillers. I'm not going to deal with them anymore. And I don't know if you know you or your viewers understand, like those painkillers almost grab you. They embrace you and they hold on to you very tightly. So to come off prescription pain medication that I've been on for that many years was extremely hard, extremely hard, you know? So I couldn't just do that normally. There's no way I could do that. But having gone through this experience and having the realization that I need to be off of them, not because they're bad, but because that doesn't serve my purpose anymore was so real to me and so powerful to me that the, the repercussions of the withdrawals didn't bother me anymore. They didn't. I didn't deal with any withdrawals, actually. And for having been on pain medication for 10 years, oxycodone, oxycodone, um, oxycotton, morphine, I quit cold turkey and thought, okay, this is what I need to do. And it, it really changed my life. So I'm sitting there and I wake up. I'm like, wow, I need to change something dramatically in my life. And the weird thing is that I can, I can never meditate, right? I can never meditate because I was constantly in pain. I was taking pain medication for 10 years. And that experience told me that, hey, you need to probably meditate. <laughs> you actually need to meditate. And I thought, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what meditation is. I know what prayer is, but I don't know what meditation is. And uh, how do I go about it? You know, and I wanted to understand authentically exactly what was going on. So I didn't try to research anything. I didn't try to watch YouTube videos on how to meditate, you know, because there was too many for me to even contemplate. And I came out of this near death experience and I thought, wow, let me just feel and go with what's natural to me and i started to go with what's natural to me and as i went down this path of meditation um it it profoundly changed me it was like i was praying all these years for something and never really heard an answer right and meditation was the practice of listening to what the answer is, you know? And so I would pray beforehand and live my life and go on through my normal motions and hope that things worked out. But I know I prayed and that's great. But now meditating allowed me to hear, and I would, I would argue to say the voice of God, the voice of my purpose. And the voice of my purpose spoke to one thing, and it was love. It was to become love in every form and every fashion. You know, and as I meditated more, I would create these new understandings of what it meant to become love and to understand what love was and to actually visibly see love surrounding me. You know, and I had been born into religion i walked away from religion when i was in my deepest depression and negativity and after this mde i told myself i'm going to clear my space and my beliefs so that whatever comes in is a truth to me it's not what people have told me it's not what i had hoped to believe it's not what i had faith in but it was something that was really rational to me and as I went through this place, I started to realize that love is the highest frequency that we can obtain. If everything is energy and information, which is science has proven this, right? How does this actually fit into God's plan, right? How does it actually correlate into my life? How can I have that change my life? And I realized that love being the highest frequency, it was also a self-perpetuating energy, right? 
So when I went out into nature and I would spend time in the mountains or on the ocean or in the desert, I would look at the trees or I'd look at the ocean and the waves and I would tell myself, I love this feeling. You know, I, I, I feel life. I feel alive almost. And I had numerous friends and, and family tell me that when they go out camping or they go out to the ocean or the beach, they're like, wow, I feel alive. Well, what, what is that? What is feeling alive? You know, <laughs> and for me, it was the energy that was produced from that experience. And during my meditation, I realized that that feeling or that energy that you're feeling is the purest unadulterated form of the energy of love being created in front of you. And it's being actually resonated within your body. You know? So when I came back to my body, there was this resistance. I was like, why is there resistance? Because my body lives for sustaining itself. My body longs for sustaining itself and it creates an environment around me and it had created this environment around me where I needed things to make me feel happy. I needed things for my body to exhibit joy and love, but it wasn't my body, it was my soul. And when I looked at the freedom of, of, of the ocean and the mountains, that was my soul that was responding to it. It wasn't my body. My body, my entire life up to my last NDE, was the one in charge of this whole existence and this experience. But after my NDE, my spirit took over and said, hey, let me take over. Let me show you what this is really about. You know what I mean? And I was like, okay, go for it. Because I failed myself many times. Go ahead. And it took me down this road of understanding the truth. And that truth is that love is the greatest and most powerful frequency. And it's a self-perpetuating energy, right? Love is a self-perpetuating energy. When you think about the experience of being in a relationship with somebody you love, or you think about the experience of being in nature, right? Which is the pure, unadulterated energy of life. You feel alive. You feel a new freedom. And that's what we're meant to feel. That's who we are at our core, you know? So this last near-death experience opened up something that was almost hidden within my soul. And I, I couldn't be more thankful for being so close to death in my life, right? It's really, it's really crazy. Actually. But having been so close to death now, I see with really the truth of life is it's love with no judgment It's to really embrace and experience the balance of life you know and as long as i'm doing that i'm living my purpose you know and and the the voice of becoming my purpose for me was becoming the purpose of love or becoming the purpose of restoring life and giving energy to life and energy to people and speaking positivity and no judgment being held. And to me, that's the truth. And as I've shifted my views and as I've shifted my experiences, everything has started to work out for me. I no longer, again, I no longer react to things that are happening to me because everything is happening for me. Everything is a deviation or a concentration of what I should be doing. I love the fact that you can draw that energy that love from uh, the physical world yeah i mean the physical world is really a spiritual creation it really is and it was created out of love and so it is full of love and yet we mistreat the earth so badly when when we should be embracing it yeah, yeah. i agree i mean what, what i found is that like we all call this life right we all call this experience life but for me it's not life it's love what we are experiencing right now is love because we are in balance. We are able to live. We are growing and we are nurturing ourselves, right? That to me is love. But the experience of hanging out with people or the experience of going out and doing something fun is life to me, you know? But everything, everything in its entirety, as long as we're existing, is love. So we are living within the manifestation of love. Mm -hmm. 
when you say become the purpose, if the purpose is love, then that's what we're meant to become. That, that, that's what I feel it is. It's love I'm, itself. Yeah. yeah and, it's, and, and in another interview, you said, no one can mess with me because I am a being of love. And I love yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Crazy truth, right? Because I would always worry about acknowledging people's view of me or understanding of me. And that was because I was not living within the purpose of love. But the truth is, is that when you live within love, you live within balance. You understand that everything is within the balance of your life and what it is meant to become. And you're meant to understand and and connect with your spirit, right? Your body will naturally have the tendency to go towards um, earthly decisions, right? Your body wants to sustain happiness. Your body wants to also engage in emotions, right? But emotions are not a truth. Emotions are an interpretation of a truth, right? But your spirit speaks to one truth. Your spirit speaks to a balance of love. And that, that's really it. Like all the emotions are based upon love. You think about um, when babies are born, right? When babies are born, their brains are not fully functioned, right? But they feel really two emotions, balance and imbalance. And I would argue that the balance they feel is love and the imbalance is the lack of love right? The, the feeding or the, the, the giving of milk is love. And the takeaway is not milk or the dirty diaper or some form of, of disturbance within that love. You know, and then we, we grow into these bodies and we grow into our, our you know, pre-pubescent uh, life and then we, our, our teenage life and then our adult life, you know, and we, we change and we build upon those two emotions, right? And we compound it and we create subcategories for each one of them. But really, if you go back to it, it's really just cut and dry. It's either you're feeling love or you're not feeling love, right? Whether it, it's, it's, it's stress for a job, you're either feeling love for that job or you're not. That's all it is, you know? So we feel love and we don't feel love. And the absence of love is a chaos. It's the frustration of life. It's a depression. It's the hopes to change something that would create a, an environment that would embrace love and create love. The you recognition know? that we are love means that we're never without love. Exactly. We are living within love. You know what I mean? We are <laughs> yeah. within love and we are surrounded by love because each one of us is a physical manifestation of love. Right. And, you know. That blast of light you received in the tunnel, I think, must have not only educated you, but turned you into a, an educator as well. It, it, it's, uh, Lee, it's profoundly changed my life. It really has. I came back, and uh, honestly, I didn't know who I was. I was like, who, who am I? Who am I now? You know, and I, I lost friends along the way. I've lost relationships along the way. And... Um, it, it's really created this feeling in me to to strive to become what my purpose is, right? And I didn't know what my purpose was. I didn't, like, I had been searching my whole life for my purpose. You know, who am I? What am I? Um, but I am. I am love. I am the embodiment of energy. I am the embodiment of power, you know? And uh, coming to that conclusion, fully understanding who I was from that near-death experience is, you know, it really created a divide within certain people in my life, but then it created a stronger bond with, with different people. And uh, for that, I'm grateful, you know, and realizing that nothing is negative, but everything is, is meant for you. I had to really realize why this was happening. Yeah. And that just that one phrase become your purpose is <laughs> uh, what, a, what a, just that is a lesson, uh, a deep lesson in itself. Yeah. I mean, that, that was singularity, the most powerful thing I've ever heard in my life. Become the purpose. And I have spent the last three years trying to understand what my purpose is and, and realizing that this life truly is based upon balance. It is based upon the, the experience of energy, you know, and the spirit and who we are and what we're becoming. 
I finally have been able to find that becoming the purpose means becoming the embodiment and physical manifestation of love. That really is my purpose. You know, and when you become that, you give out the information to others. You give out the love to other people. You give out the ability to help people heal. You give out the ability for other people to see a truth. You know, and there's there's no other purpose that's greater than helping people alleviate and elevate past negativity and past frustration and past, you know, um, you know, a dependency upon, you know, depression. And that's what I was living in for so long. Have you been giving some thought to how you're going to share this understanding with other people? I have. I have. I have um, a friend of mine that's writing a book right now currently. Um, and the book is pretty much surrounding the entirety of this ex- existence. It talks about the spirituality aspect. It talks about science. It talks about, you know, God. And um, But for me, you know, I've been trying to work through this and trying to understand how I could become the purpose. And I really think ultimately it depends upon me becoming the, the embodiment of love. Um, it becomes the embodiment of, you know, physically interacting with people and encouraging and empowering them and showing them their power within themselves. Um, and I think the more that I do that, the more that I truly become everything that this world is, is meant to become. And I know that my interaction with them is ultimately changing their direction, their path, and where they're going. Well, Jeremiah, we're just about out of time. And I'm wondering is if people wanted to find out more about you or keep track of where you're going with all this, uh, is there any way they can get in touch with you or follow you on a website? I mean, I don't have any websites, but I'm on Facebook, Jeremiah Pospisil. I'm on Instagram. And feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or or have any follow-up questions. Um, I'd be glad to answer them. But yeah, I'm just out there. I'm just getting to know how to expose this. Yeah. Well, Jeremiah, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and how that last one changed you so dramatically. If listeners do have questions, they can reach you, as you said, on uh, Facebook and so forth. Or they can also leave comments for you where the show appears on our YouTube channel at NDE Radio with Lee Whitting YouTube. And if listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 450 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE Radio site and hit the Past Shows button or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE Radio library. Be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.